that it's really a blessing for all of us to be born during a generation that you are living in. And I say it with all humility and with all sincerity, and we thank God for you to be uh, able to capture something that God gave you by way of vision and revelation, and then for you to have the audacity and courage to be able to break away and to be able to say, this is what God is doing and I'm going to lead the charge. It means that you have to be prepared to be crucified and you have been crucified over and over and over, but yet you're still standing. And today I want to stand with the hundreds of thousands of people around the world that are grateful. We have never had the opportunity to say thank you, but I want to stand to be able to say thank you. I watch you from afar and I have the opportunity now to stand in front of an entire uh, congregation to be able to say thank you for my own self, for my life, because you demonstrate to me what a true man looks like, a true man, not just a man of God, but a true man. And we need more of you in this world. And what you have not only the audacity and courage to do is to be able to say, I have run my leg of the race and I'm going to pass the baton onto the next individual and then to stand with that individual to nurture their greatness. It takes someone greater than the person that they put in place to nurture the greatness. And I thank God for you and I'm encouraged, I'm encouraged because so many people have grown indifferent in the body of Christ. No one wants to look at the pink elephant and call a spade a spade, but they've grown indifferent. But what you're doing is bringing hope to the next generation, the next generation of preachers, the next generation of apostles, the next generation of Christian leaders. You are bringing hope and you are restoring hope. And I wanna say thank you to you today. To the general overseer, and I, I call you Lady Deborah, and not just uh, Pastor Deborah, but Lady Deborah. Um, in Britain, they have knights, and the opposite of a knight is a lady, and that's someone who has the courage to just do more than look beautiful. They're change agents, and you're a change agent in and of your right, and I want to honor you on behalf of all the women, not just in the body of Christ, but all the women in the world, I want to salute you. It takes a great woman to stand next to and with a great man, especially a trailblazer. Uh, they, they, think out, they don't just think outside of the box. They go out on a limb, and then they, 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 they challenge the limb to break. And you're, you've been on many broken limbs only to prove to you that God gave you wings to fly. And I wanna thank you for flying, I wanna thank you. And then to Bishop Lawrence Brandon and the second presiding bishop, and Bishop Darrell Brister, we enjoyed your word on giving. And the church has become so indifferent when it comes to giving. And um, I'm just praying that God would just put a spiritual, economic, and uh, f uh, a financial um, defibrillator on the heart of believers and shock us back into uh, consciousness of what we have to do. We could do more if we had more. And uh, the said commentary is that we make money during a year and then we have to give the money back to the same um, kingdom that we took it from because uh, we don't have enough money to build our own. But I'm decreeing and declaring that this would be the last season that this movement doesn't have its own, that you will begin to pool your collective resources to build the multiplex that is necessary uh, for us to have our own so we can circulate our money like the Jews amongst ourselves, amen? And so there's a specific prayer that I'm gonna be praying over you before I leave because we need you to be wealthy, amen? How many of you wanna be wealthy? I didn't just say have a lot of money. Wealth is different from having a lot of money, amen? 
And so we need you to be wealthy, and we're going to be praying a specific prayer over you to break uh, the spirit of lack over your life and bring you into the arena of more than enough. Amen? You can say amen. 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 Your amen sounds suspicious. <laughs> you can say amen one more time. Amen. amen. And then you, um, uh, the, those of you that are standing with Bishop Joseph Walker III and for what God is calling him to along with his wife, Deborah Stephanie Walker. And um, these are critical moments that are demanding uh, uh, a certain kind of leader. And uh, if it was not God's will, you would not be pushed in that position. And what we need to do is to build a campaign around you, just like David Pluff and Axelrod built a campaign around our president, Barack Obama. Um, it wasn't just his uh, prowess or his intelligence. He had a team that built a campaign. And we're praying that God will bring that team around you to build a campaign so that you could carry the legacy over. We are one generation away from being extinct. And the same birthplace of the church has now become a tourist attraction. And so we have a lot of work to do in our generation. And this is the generation that will be different from a previous. We pulled ourselves up with our bootstraps and we navigated terrain uh, based on the Holy Spirit without fathers and mothers to birth us out. But we are the generation that will become fathers and mothers to birth out a new generation. And you have a tough job ahead of you. But we know that you have a group of individuals that are around you that will help to chart the course and to build a strategy for sustainability. And I, 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 I don't envy you one bit. Um, it's going to be tough, but God has the grace for you. And we need you to succeed. We need that. We need it in our community. We need it amongst our own. And so I'm going to do everything I possibly can to pray you through. If I can't do anything, I can pray. And I know how to de deal with demons in the realm of the spirit. So I'm going to be praying. I have a group of prayer warriors that pray with me. And we're going to be praying for you. And then all the bishop council and uh, the college of bishops and the tiers of leadership. And those of you that are gathering together, we greet you in Jesus' name. Our Father and our God, we thank you for the time allotted that you would give me the ability of articulation, that you would take these concepts and that you would put it in the correct context and then give me the ability to navigate uh, the spiritual terrain so that we will walk away with principles that we can apply to fulfill your original plan and purpose. Think through my mind, speak through my lips, let there be none of me and all of you. We thank you for the anointing that is commensurate with this assignment. We thank you for the fresh word. It's not by our might nor by our power, but it's by the Spirit. Holy Spirit, we acknowledge your presence and we thank you, Father, Father, for what you will do and for how you will confirm your words with signs and wonders. Break the spirit of indifference. Take us to the next level. Let us walk away and leave the old so that we can walk in the new. Bless our time together in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hug the person on your left and right and just announce to them, this is the last time you're going to see me in this state. I'm never going to be in this place ever again. I'm never going to be here spiritually. I'm never going to be here financially. I'm never going to be here intellectually. I'm not going to be here socially. I'm never going to be in this spot, this place, another day in my life. Tonight is your going away party. We're going to, uh, we're going to forget those things which are behind. And we're going to lunge out in the deep. And tonight is the night. The spot that you're standing marks the ending of your history and the beginning of your destiny and your best days. This is not just a colloquial expression. This is a truism. Your best days lie ahead of you. And I tell you, this is the worst your life will ever be. This is the worst your finances will ever be. This is the worst you will ever feel. Your best days stretch ahead of you. You have nothing to look back to and to look back
back uh, uh, for. You have everything that lies ahead of you, everything to look forward to. And I'm decreeing and declaring that you will hear the word of the Lord and that you would use these principles to do something great in your generation. You may have your seat. You're going to have three opportunities or four opportunities uh, before the night is out. Opportunity number one, you're going to have the opportunity to pick up a copy of this tape. And you're going to want to pick up the copy of this tape. I'm going to be speaking very, very fast because we have a lot of territory to cover. And um, I've already spent some time and my time starts ticking when I read the scripture. And um, uh, we already um, have... Uh, the opportunity to uh, uh, speak to you, but I'm going to be speaking so quickly. I want to download as many concepts as I possibly can. I, wanted to, I want to put it in a context. A concept without a context brings you into the realm of frustration because you will, will not have the ability to properly apply. And where there's no application, there could be no manifestation. And so we've just wasted our time. So we want to place it in the proper context. And if your context is wrong, when you receive a concept, your conclusion will be wrong. I'm gonna say it again. If your context is wrong, when you receive a concept, then your conclusion is wrong. So that means that no amount of me preaching is gonna make a difference in your life if your context is wrong. Are you with me? So I have the opportunity now to do a JBAS, enlarge my territory, just, just increase my ability to receive the downloads. It's an enlargement and it's ex an ex expansion. And I've asked God uh, and, and prepared for this very hard and I've asked God for a special anointing because I'm coming behind some great preachers. And uh, I can't say more than what these preachers have said. I can only offer you my perspective on a particular topic. And so it's not, uh, and you're not going to hear anything new. You're just going to hear a new perspective. Amen? And so I'm going to weigh in on a subject. That's what I'm going to do. Weigh in on a subject. But it's going to come to you. Uh, like a drive-by shooting. So it's going to be quick. We're going to come in, we're going to spray, and we're going to drive out. And you're going to want to get a copy of the tape. I'm going to tell you why. What, what I'm downloading, I was invited by an executive from Coca-Cola. And I was invited also by a country. And I introduced the concept, and the president of that country uh, arranged a meeting, and we sat and we begin to talk about how to turn around a country and what's going on in the world. And I was just shooting um, and saying, okay, this is what's going on. Here are the shifts that have happened and this is the role that you need to play. Here are the emerging markets. And he said to me, he said, if you give me that information, if you give it to me, I'll give you citizenship in my country. And I was tempted and I said, I will sell it to you. And I, I really meant it. I would sell it to you, and then I would spend some time as your consultant to share with you how you can turn your nation around. And so we're in no negotiations. And I'm going to sell it for a few million dollars. What you're carrying is very expensive. And most people cannot afford to sit in your presence. But because you've learned how to devalue yourself and dumb down to fit in and blend in, you become a part of the problem and not a part of the solution. And, and so I'm going to talk very fast. But what you're getting is a few million dollars given to you. And you're going to want to go to the back and you're going to want to pay whatever it costs for that tape. I don't know if it's $15. If it was me, it would be uh, probably $150,000 for this one tape, if it was me, but it's not me. So $15, $150,000, get the tape and stop nickel and diming yourself. And I want you to listen to it over and over, and I want you to take a pen and piece of paper and take your notes and pray through the revelation. The points are gonna be fast. The second half, I'm doing a PowerPoint. The first half, I'm gonna load it into 
the context. Number two, I'm going to make a strong suggestion. There are three books in the back, two in particular. One is the rules of engagement for overcoming your past. The Bible said, forget those things behind you. And uh, in this book, there's a, 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 a it's, you could read it in, in, in a night. There's a um, section called the spirit of an orphan. And I've discovered that um, in many of our congregations, we have individuals with orphan spirits. Uh, they come to church, but they haven't joined. They haven't connected. And we have a generation of believers that if anything looks strange, they'll go from church to church, ministry to ministry, just jumping and jumping and jumping around. It's a spirit of an orphan. And uh, it's identified here. And one of the reasons why we have a spirit of an orphan is because the leadership has a spirit of an orphan. Just because you show up at a meeting doesn't mean that you're connected to the head. And just because you're doing an action doesn't mean that you're obedient. Activity is not obedience. Obedience is an attitude, not an action. And so what we have is, is something that needs to be broken. It's in this book. I give you permission to preach the whole book, and you don't need to give me credit. The other thing is I'm going to suggest that you encourage your membership to read this book. It'll take a couple of years of pastoring and deliverance and healing, inner healing and all of that. It'll cut and shave a couple of years off and bring about a certain health, healthiness in the pew. And the last thing is the book Push. It, this is forwarded by Rod Parsley, Dr. Rod Parsley, and is persevering until success happens through prayer. And I, I, I wrote the manuscript about 10 years ago and sat on it and released it this year. And there is a difference between an, a d demonic attack and contraction. When, when, when Hannah was pregnant with a son, heaven was pregnant with a prophet. And she not only delivered a son, she not only had one child that she delivered, she actually delivered triplets, one in the natural. And then it was two kings behind uh, uh, Samuel that she actually birthed into the kingdom. Many times we are rebuking the devil when it's God. And God is birthing us out. He's not only birthing us out into new realms. And there's a difference between a realm and a dimension. We talk about going to another dimension and we talk about going to another realm as if they're synonymous. They're not synonymous. And uh, when we talk about realms, we talk about someone who understands the dimension of a revelation. And I'll give you an example, the revelation of faith. There's the law of faith, the gift of faith. There is pistos, saving faith. And there's the fruit of faith. That's the length, the breadth, the height, the width. That's a dimension of revelation. When you get the full dimension of a revelation, then you go to another realm. And we talk about dimensions. There are four levels or four different dimensions that takes you into a realm. And then there are seven levels within a realm that puts you at the top where you're the head and not the tail. You're the first and not last. You're above only and not beneath. And each one of these stages requires you to be birthed out. It's, it's the, it's the uh, revelation that God gave to Nicodemus when, when, when he said, look, I want to understand more about this kingdom that you were preaching. And Jesus then says to him, you've got to be born again. He said, I got it. I'm going to enter into my mother's womb the second time. And Jesus said, okay, you've got the concept, but your context is wrong. So he was introducing him to the wombs of the spirit, but he did not have the full revelation. So he wasn't moving in the dimension of it. And so Jesus begins to explain to him, this is what a womb looks like. Paul had a revelation. He said, I'm going to travail until Christ be formed in you. Job talks about the womb of the morning. And so there are wombs of the spirit. There are 26 wombs of the spirit. What happens if you are having multiple births? 
where God is birthing you out, he's birthing you out spiritually and he's birthing you out economically and he's bringing you into a different realm economically where he's moving you from thousands of dollars to millions of dollars to billions of dollars. And each time you're birthed, it's booby trap. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, be ye lifted up, ye everlasting doors, and the king of glory shall come in. Each realm that God will move you in is booby-trapped. And it's booby-trapped to, to weed out those that love the road of least resistance. Those that don't want it bad enough. And when you come to a wall, the wall is not there to keep you out. The wall is there to determine whether you want this thing bad enough. How bad do you want this thing? Are you serious? So when you push against this wall, it's to develop the muscles that you need in the next round. Not the round that you're being birthed out, the round that you're being birthed into. And most people give up. They become indifferent because they don't understand the birthing of the spirit and what goes on when God takes you from one realm to the next realm. A dimension is an understanding. A realm is different from a dimension. A realm means that you're in automatic pilot. Hebrews chapter 11, these people that were uh, it talked about, about faith, being in the realm of faith, God wasn't talking about them operating out of the fruit of faith faith or the gift of faith or the law of faith. They were living in the realm of faith. They could say something. They speak to this, the sun and the sun stands still. They didn't have to rebuke the devil. They didn't have to fast a thousand days. They didn't have to do all of that. They just spoke and the, the, the atmosphere shifted. The, the astronomical world shifted because they spoke. I'm going to give you another example. If Oprah Winfrey shows up and says, look, I read uh, Cindy Trim's book, Commanding Your Morning Daily Devotional, and I want to recommend everyone get a copy of this book. This is going to be a New York bestseller within an hour. Why? Not just because Oprah Winfrey is a teller a personality, but because she lives in the realm of influence. Are you with me? So whatever she speaks, bam, there it is. And what God wants to do is not just move you from one dimension to another dimension where you get more and more revelation and you have greater understanding. He wants to move you into the realm of that thing. So we're not just talking about you getting wealth. We're talking about you creating wealth. There is a difference between give and it shall be given you of good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, shall man give unto your bosom. There is a difference between you giving and another man giving to you. And there's the difference between the man that is receiving and the man that is giving. You're going to get this in a minute. Here's the line. Either you're going to be the beneficiary or you're going to be the benefactor. Either you want to stay as the man waiting for someone to give you something or you're going to be the assigned one that gives. Are you getting this? This is why we have to understand the difference between a tithe, an offering, and the seed. When we stand, and I am going to stand to receive a seed, I'm not receiving an offering. An offering does something different for you. What Bishop received was your offering. But your seed is your capital. He gives seed to the sower. When a country uh, goes into a bankruptcy, it's because they have no more capital to discharge their liability. They need capital. Seed is not your offering. Seed is your capital. If you want to play in earth's markets, you can't play as a beggar. You've got to play as a creator of wealth. Wisdom is known by her children. Where do I liken this generation? I liken them to children. They have never grown up. They have never gone past tithes and offering. And if you've been in church 10, 15, 20 years, you're a pastor, you're a leader, the last thing you need is to come to a meeting like this and have someone charge you about a tithe and an offering. Turn to your neighbor, say, you should have been over that a long time ago. 
We, we need to go from just finances into economics. We should be holding and controlling the purse strings of communities. Your, your ministry should be determining what goes on in terms of establishing social policies within the community that you live in. Nothing should move except you speak to it. You hold the veto. Government doesn't hold the veto. You hold the veto. Money answers all things. And uh, unless we get over just the tithes and the offering and we really begin to understand seed and we talk about seed as if it's synonymous with an offering, there's, there, there is a difference. He gives seed to the sower so that you can be rich in every way, to be generous in every occasion. That's what the translation says, the NIV. Rich in every way. So your wealth is connected to your seed. And unless you have the revelation of what goes on, when a preacher stands up and says, listen, we're going to receive your seed, and we want about 50 of you to write a check for $1,000. Those 50 should be insulted that someone is asking for $1,000. Turn to your name and say, I'm insulted. I'm insulted. She's, she's just asking me for $1,000. I'm insulted. I'm really insulted. When you get the revelation of what a seed does, and when you have an opportunity to plant a seed in the soil that God appoints, God is obligated. He's obligated to open up a portal for you to play in emerging and solid uh, economies. He's obligated to open up a door so that you can have an ROI in a specific industry. Your seed is industry specific. He, he gives seed to the sower. He gives capital. There's a difference between your money and capital. When you spend your money, it becomes a currency. When you invest it, it becomes capital. You heard of seed money. Seed money is not given to you to spend and buy a Louis Vuitton and Chanel. Seed money is given to you so that you can invest in a business, a legitimate business, and prayerfully it will be Wall Street friendly and globally scalable. I decree and declare over any business owner that your business is no longer a mom and pop. He has given you seed so that you can play in the world's economy. And I decree and declare you have an ROI. I decree that any seed that you plant in this ministry, I decree and declare you will no longer be a child saying I have piped and you haven't danced. I have lamented and you haven't mourned. When you go to the marketplace, you are not taking the same old song and dance. You are coming to take over an industry. But I'm gonna park that to a side. When you go to the back, go get pushed, the 26 wounds of the spirit. You're not under a demonic attack, you're pregnant. Something is being birthed through you. You are birthing something out. You're carrying something. And the issue with most individuals is we don't have midwives in the church anymore. Nobody to speak strength in you. Nobody to speak to what you're pregnant with. Nobody to birth you out. This is why Moses was uh, uh, 40 years overdue. At 390 years, God began to birth him out, but he did not know the difference. God bless you. That's $1,000. That's what I'm talking about. But I'm going to give all of you opportunities. Turn to somebody and say, I hope she doesn't insult me and ask for $1,000. <laughs> 10000 50000 100000 You have to learn how to connect with that. Because the moment you believe that you don't have it, you will never have it.
Repeat after me, I'm a thousand dollar giver. And next year, I'm gonna give God a raise. I'm a $10,000 giver. And next year, I'm gonna give him a raise. I'm a hundred thousand dollar giver. And next year, I'm gonna give him a raise. I'm a million dollar giver. How many million dollar givers do we have in the house? I decree that you are a kingdom underwriter. You will not only create wealth, you will give wealth to the kingdom. I decree you will underwrite. You will not only make millions, you will give millions. This is not a catch 22, baby. I haven't asked you for anything. You are going to give millions to the kingdom. We're so used to people playing games. I'm not your one. I'm not the one. I don't play games. I shoot from the hip. You have to connect with what I'm saying. Because as long as you connect with lack, you'll always have lack. You got to connect with wealth. Wealth starts with a mentality, not with money. People are poor not because they don't have money. The poor, they're poor because they lack the wealth mentality. Amen. Your second opportunity is going to be the opportunity to give a seed of a thousand dollars. I'm going to say it one more time. Your amen sounds suspicious. You're going to have an opportunity to give a seed of a thousand dollars. Your, your, your amen sounds suspicious. This is not a catch-22. If you cannot connect with that, you will not be able to live in the realm of that. God bless you. No, 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 no games is going to happen. You're the benefactor. Repeat after me, I'm the benefactor. I'm not waiting on someone to give it to me. I create it. I'm a wealth creator. He gives you power to get wealth. That word get, asa, it means to create wealth. If it ain't there, I'll create it. If I don't have it, I'll create it. But I refuse to be a beggar. Beggars don't have access, ask Lazarus. He sat outside of a gate that he could have lived inside of. God bless you as you give. Amen. Take out your notepads, your iPads, and write really fast. My time is short. The book of Luke chapter 5, verses 1 to 11. Amen. Luke chapter 5, 1 to 11. The Bible said, and it came to pass that as the people pressed upon him to hear the word of God, God bless you, he stood by the lake of Gennesareth and saw two ships standing by the lake, but the fishermen were gone out of them, and they were washing their nets. I might as well go straight into my message and cut out the introduction. I was going to talk to you about the setting, how Dr. Luke had written this particular uh, book of the gospel. He had written it to a specific individual by the name of Theophilus. His name and title was indicative of an individual who is purported to be a Roman official. He was a high official, and he was in a position of great wealth, affluence, and influence. It was thought that Theophilus probably was the publisher of his duet, uh, Magnum Opus, I would call it, his great work the thesis of which is clearly delineated in Acts chapter 1, verses 1 to 3, where he clearly says, I'm writing this, O Theophilus, to begin to talk to you about the work that Jesus began to do and to teach. He not only taught it, but he epitomized his teaching. And I'm writing to set this out. And he wrote the Gospel of Luke, and he wrote the book of Acts, Theophilus would have been like a publisher, so he would have dedicated this particular work to the one that underwrote the writing of this gospel by the name of the uh, Theophilus. And he said that against the backdrop of the kingdom work that was established by Jesus, I'm writing so that you can have an understanding and to give you the context from which I preach and the rest of the apostles 
administering this word. The place that Luke would have written this particular uh, book or the two books, the duet, would have been in Rome. And this is very significant because we think of Rome as something that was antiquated and bar bar barbaric. But Rome was the superpower of that day, much like the United States of America is the superpower today. And it's against this backdrop that God calls us in this generation to fulfill our calling, to fulfill our purpose. So it has a lot of significance. You could have been born in another time, another generation, another season. But why is it God birthed you in this season, this generation, with the United States of America being the superpower? It was Rome that represented naked, brute power. It represented uh, just government without the power of God. And naked, brute military power. Whatever we want, we take. It would be the first superpower, different from Persia, different from Egypt, different from Babylon, that said, hey, there's something up with keeping indentured slaves in their country. It would be the first government that said, look, we're going to Romanize the world, but we're not going to pull people out and bring them to Rome, just like Babylon did with Daniel. Babylon could have kept Daniel in his native, native country, but to control what was going on with the best and the brightest, Babylon pulls the best and brightest from out of the nation and then indoctrinates them through the University of Babylon, out of which you get the Hebrew boys and Daniel. And they were given a scholarship to attend the university because they were gonna indoctrinate their minds through the educational system. Now, the problem with the church is this, that by the time we get the average believer, the average believer has already been indoctrinated by Babylon. And so what Babylon gives us is people who has language recognition but no language comprehension. And this is why you don't see the change that we should see and the progress that we should see in ministry because they get what you're saying, but you cannot have application without comprehension. And so if you've been educated, I don't care if you have an MA, a PhD, I have several PhDs. But it is what it is, it ain't what it ain't. The church, therefore, has to understand that we're suffer suffering from an identity crisis. We are not a religious institution. The church is the educational institution of the kingdom. So we are re-educating those that have been miseducated. We, we, we are not products, my dear, of our environment. Our nearest relative is not an orangutan. I don't care what the anthropologists, anthropologists are saying. We, our nearest relative is not a monkey, is not an orangutan. We are from God, our Father which art in heaven. We did not emanate, come from. We did not come from an ape. Are you following me? So we are not driven by instinct. We are, we are led by the Spirit of God. And there's a difference. Are you with me? And so against the backdrop, he's writing in Rome. And this was the same government that was nervous when Jesus was born. How can a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes, laid in a manger, be a threat? to a government, a superpower. How can a baby be a threat to an entire government? And when they, when they tried Jesus, they didn't find him guilty of raising the dead. They didn't find him guilty of miracles. They didn't find him guilty of any of those things. He was not tried for religious reason. He was tried and found guilty because they felt as if he was going to overtake the government and establish his own kingdom. And he was found guilty of, of, of organizing a political coup. It was crime against the governments. Are you the king of the Jews? They were nervous. 
Because if you're a king, are we expecting a military? And Jesus was able to say, look, if I wanted to, I would summon how many uh, legions? I could summon the whole military of heaven, but I don't need to. Because if you crucify me and you just raise that cross, it's on. Because if I be lifted up, it's not in the crucifixion, it's in the resurrection. It's not what the devil does to you and destroys, it's after the resurrection that he needs to be concerned about you. Drive the nails in my hand. God is after your death anyway. For me to live is Christ, to die is Cain. It's A.D. after you die. After they crucify you, after they lie on you, after they talk about you, they don't need to be concerned before. They need to be concerned with what God is going to do with you after the crucifixion. They were nervous because... <laughs> The Roman government would Romanize the world. And they had a slogan. Here's was the slogan. It was Caesar's slogan. Caesar's kingdom come. And Caesar's will be done. And Jesus said, listen boys, when you pray. Pray our father. Which art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. My father's kingdom come. My father's will be done. The moment you understand that the message of the kingdom is a message of empowerment, is a message that if you can preach it and understand the concept without the religious stuff, without it, you will empower a people to take over communities, to take over kingdoms, to take over industries. Your members will be the leaders in industry if you can only get an understanding of the message of the kingdom. And Rome felt if we, if we just let this man stay, we're not gonna be the superpower. Jesus said, you're absolutely right because the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. They were threatened. They were threatened. Rome. Rome was a superpower that gave us much. Rome gave us architects and engineers. Gave us highway infrastructures. He had to be born during the Roman government. Jesus had to be born. Why? The fulfillment of Isaiah 40. Uh, the voice that cries in the wilderness. It used to be a wilderness. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for God. And every valley shall be exalted, and every mountain shall be made low, and every crooked place made straight, and every rough place made plain. What was the prophetic idea or reason why or intent that this prophet was prophesying? He was prophesying into a future. And he was prophesying that there would come a government that would be involved in building highways and infrastructures to sustain the ministry of Jesus. There would be no other government that would connect cities and connect towns. But when Rome Romanized the world, they said, let us connect cities. And this would be the first worldwide government or this first superpower that would create city states. Listen to me carefully. Everything in the universe is, is, is moving in concert, synchronized and syncopated with God's original plan and purpose for your life. Everything that is happening techn technologically, everything that is happening socially, everything is, that is happening politically, is, is happening to move things into alignment to support your call. You couldn't be born in a generation before technology. You have to be born in the same generation as, as, as Bill Gates, the same generation as, 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 as uh, the iPad guy. Steve Jobs, you had to be born in this generation 
because God is going to use this technology to give you a worldwide ministry so that you can go into all the earth and preach the gospel without leaving your city, without getting on an airplane. That means it is official. Your, your congregation is only your studio audience. You can pastor millions from around the world by using modern technology. Preach to the world. Don't preach to your congregation. You have people that will follow you from Africa and Asia and, and the Middle East and the Arab nations. The other day I was on TV and I was preaching to an Arab nation. There was 26 million viewers. 26 million viewers. Another time I was invited. And they, they, they were, they, they, uh, I don't know, they rigged something and they managed to get me into these Arab nations with all the Muslims and everywhere. And they reported that 60 million Muslims were viewing, illegally viewing. Jesus had to be born. You have to be born during this generation. Let me ha hurry through. You have to be born in this generation. So when I look at the gospel, if I were to weigh in on perspective, I would say that Matthew is a book about understanding the king and his kingdom. Mark is a book about servant leadership in the kingdom. John is a book about kingdom relationships. And Luke is about the dynamics within our kingdom. How does this kingdom work? How does it move? And in particular, kingdom economics, biblical finance, hence our text. And my simple topic is shift. Just, just, just shift, and I call it subtopic, the Jesus Project, the Jesus Project, the Jesus Project. Jesus was in the Nazareth, uh, playing out his assignment. The Bible said that the people were pressing him for the word of God. This was the masses. They had come out they had to hear. But Jesus, beyond touching the masses with a message of uh, deliverance and healing and empowerment, that gave them dignity and hope and meaning and purpose. Most of them wanted miracles. They weren't concerned about connecting to Jesus per se, but they were more concerned with the bread and the fishes and the miracles. They weren't all prepared to sacrifice. And this is the mass uh, majority of individuals that are in your congregation. And they come because they need fire insurance, just in case there is a hell. <laughs> They'll be in the elevator going up. <laughs> so you're not going to get too much out of them. But in the midst, uh, there were businessmen that were working in an industry. And they had worked and worked, and the industry was shifting. The Bible said he borrowed one of the ships of Simon Peter, just launch out just, just a little bit from the uh, boundary, the shore, and he used it as a pulpit, and to say thank you, he gave him an instruction, and he said, look, thanks so very much. What you've given me is a seed. You've given me just, just a seed, but I want you to launch out into the deep. I want to take you into another realm. And I want to show you what you can do. And I'm going to give you an idea. When you give seed, don't look for money. Look for an idea. You gotta work ideas. You gotta be an idea generator. The bigger your ideas, the more money you make. They don't pay secretaries as much as they pay CEOs. They pay secretaries to do the grunt work, the busy work, the mundane work. But they pay CEOs to think. That's returning us back to the Adamic state. And so he says, I'm going to give you an idea. When you get out there in industry, what I want you to do is to cast nets, plural, out there. Cast the nets, plural. 
So the scripture lets us know from out of the book of Matthew that the kingdom of heaven is likened unto a net that was cast into the sea and gathered every kind. Uh, that's, the, that's the idea, the kingdom of heaven. What is a net? The net was the technology of that day. You had two economies that ran parallel. You had the agrarian, what they planted, and the sheep that they raised up, and the plants that they raised up, and the gold that they mined, and the silver that they mined, that produced one economy, but they had a parallel economy. And that parallel economy was what they uh, harvested out of the sea. And even if there was a drought on the land, they still had this other economy that ran parallel. My God shall supply all. We have a parallel economy. No matter what is going on with the natural economy, we are never in recession in the kingdom. Are you with me? You don't have money problem. My God is able to supply all your need according to his riches in glory. Your church does not have money problem. They have glory problem. If you can increase the glory, you can increase the wealth. If you increase the glory, you can increase the income. If you increase the glory, we don't have glory. We don't have money problems. We have glory problems. Are you with me? And so he said, look. I want you, the same ship that I was in, that ship represents ministerial structures. And I want, I want to throw that out because your structure may sustain you today, but can it sustain you tomorrow? And we are all building these structures for a, a world that will never be in the next 20 years. Where we are going, where the people that we are going to be ministering to are not the people that you ministered to yesterday. And if you keep doing what you did yesterday, today, you are going to be irrelevant tomorrow. Your structure, most of us have structures that we have never addressed. It's the same structure that we had 20 years ago. We're operating the same way. If you're going to launch out into the deep, you've got to understand address the sustainability of the structure. Let me go on. The structure, the ship, it wasn't just a boat. The Bible said it was a ship. It was able to carry large cargo. Many of us have built a ministries, uh, hallelujah, for the congregation that we have today. And I'm going to prove to you in a couple of minutes that the world that we live in today is not going to be the world we live in tomorrow. The mindsets are going to change. The needs are going to change. Can your ministry address the generation that is yet unborn to time? We know what we, we grew up with. We know the morals. We know the ethics, but we don't live in that world today. We don't live in a world where people are respected, respectful to elders and they disrespect the man and the women of the cloth. They are not afraid of God. You cannot frighten people and tell them to go to hell. They will tell you, I live in hell. What's new? Can your structure sustain the kind of harvest God is going to bring and the type of fish you're about to drag in? The Bible said, and Jesus said to him, I, I, I just need you to thrust out and I want you to thrust, thrust out in the sea, not a beach. I want you to thrust out in the sea. The sea represents systems that control people. This morning you woke up to a world in motion. A world consists of kingdoms. There are 12 kingdoms. The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his, of, of his Christ. Kingdoms are controlled by systems. A system is a machinery. If you feed the machinery, it's automatic from one generation to the other. The United States of America is not a country. It is a company. It's a machinery that churns out its citizens. That's why you have a social security number. Your social security number doesn't have anything to do with United States of America paying you 
social security at the ending of your uh, uh, time working within industry when you retire. There is no money left in social security. So why do they have the social security system? They have that system because every day you are bought and you are sold on the stock market. And if you want me to prove it, I'll take you to Revelation chapter 18 where they talk about the commodities that keep economies buoyant. And they talk about the gold and the ivory and the purple and they talk about the linen and then they talk about slaves and the soul of men. Uh, the enemy understands it's possible for you to be saved but you be pimped and prostituted in Babylon and this is the average individual. The reason why we know that the average believer is being prostituted and pimped is because directly after this service people that will not give a thousand dollars in the kingdom you take them to Chanel, you take them to Louis Vuitton, and they're going to run up every credit card to get another purse. And it's interesting how a thousand dollars looks big in the church and how small it looks when you go get a piece of Chanel. You can't even get a, an earring from Chanel or even a necklace. A necklace like this is in the thousands. You can't even get a necklace less than three, four thousand dollars. And I watch year after year how believers come and they got Louis Vuitton and they got Gucci but they don't have any wealth. They can't even keep a roof over their head. They can't even sustain their mortgage but yet we carry symbols of wealth because we still allow Babylon to pimp and prostitute us. Turn to your neighbor and say I'm not a prostitute and I refuse to let Babylon pimp me and we don't understand hallelujah how in the book of Revelation 18 even God has to say come out of her my people hallelujah don't tell me that you love God and you don't understand the difference between the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light how many believers still have the wool pulled over their eyes the reason why I left politics I didn't leave politics I didn't leave my country because I wasn't successful I didn't leave my country because I didn't have influence I didn't leave my country to become a preacher and the number one preacher in anybody's church. I didn't leave my country to make, to come to the United States of America for a better life. I had a better life. I didn't come. I'm not preaching to be the grand poobah in anybody's church. I was the grand poobah in my country. I came because I understood that as long as I was serving my country, Babylon was pimping my intelligence. And I resign. And every year my country is still asking me, could you please come back? We need you in Bermuda. And I determined 25 years ago, if I can make money for my government, if I can make money for uh, the, the banking institution, uh, if I can make money for them, I can make money for myself. I can create money for myself. And I determined when God gave me an understanding of the kingdom, and when I resigned uh, from that position, uh, I started to create wealth based on a principle not based on a job based on a principle I'm not waiting for someone to make it happen for me when I've got an anointing to create wealth you can create it yourself you don't have to wait for an offering you don't have to wait for a tithe you've got enough intelligence to create wealth for your own ministry are you with me let me keep going God is pulling us out. And just because you're physically in a church doesn't mean you're mentally there. And many of us have fights, hallelujah, with individuals, especially during our offering times and tithe times and at seed time. And the people sit up, they're anointed before you mention money. But the moment you mention money is when this uh, uh, spirit comes in the church. And I see it over and over and over. The enemy is not 
not going to cause that spirit of indifference and suspicion uh, to come upon you when you're buying your pocketbook in, in Louis Vuitton at Gucci. Have you noticed that spirit doesn't come upon you when you're in that store, when you are exchanging your money, hallelujah, to underwrite the economy of the kingdom of darkness. But the moment you look as if you are opening up your wallet to underwrite the kingdom of light, there is a spirit that will hit the church quicker than I can say my name. It is because the enemy is fighting you. He's fighting you because he understands the dynamics of the kingdom and he cannot have the light come off and you associate your financial breakthrough with a seed. He cannot have that and so he's going to allow a spirit of suspicion. All preachers want is money. Let me ask you something. What does Citibank want from you? Let me ask you something. What does the grocery store want from you? Let me ask you something. What does Gucci want from you? What does Walmart want for you? And this is how we know that so many believers are still spiritually connected uh, with a system that will chew your vision up and chew your purpose up and spit it out for dinner. Once you understand uh, that the whole message that Jesus preached was to deliver individual from the control of a system. We have systems uh, that are machineries uh, that demand to be fed. Uh, and each one of these systems, uh, hallelujah, is what we need to have dominion over. Uh, we've got to raise up individuals in our church that want to do more than preach. Uh, not every prophet had to stand up in the church and say, thus save the Lord. Uh, I look at the prophetess. Her name was Deborah the prophet. Uh, and she could prophesy you under the carpet. Uh, hallelujah. But she was a legal mind. Uh, and God used her as a legal advisor. Uh, hallelujah to the military. Hallelujah. In order to advise the military. Uh, hallelujah. What to do. She was a strategist. Uh, not everybody that is a prophet. Uh, hallelujah. Needs to be. Uh, hallelujah. Standing behind the pulpit. Uh, we need uh, in our generation Josephs. Uh, where are the Josephs? Uh, where are the Solomons? Uh, where are the Cyrus? Uh, hallelujah. Everybody wants to have. Uh, hallelujah. A title. Uh, hallelujah. Everybody wants their ministry to play out. Uh, but where are the John the Baptist? Uh, that say I'm going to take my pulpit. Uh, hallelujah. In the community where it really matters. Uh, I'm going to be a policy maker. Uh, I'm going to be a politician. Uh, I'm going to be a president. Uh, where are the Daniels? Uh, where are the Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Uh, where are the Dr. Luke's? Uh, where are the luminaries and educators? Uh, hallelujah. That are anointed uh, to go into the world system. Uh, hallelujah. And then to be able to say, uh, I'm coming to take over uh, because you're a thinker, uh, because you're the best and the brightest. Uh, hallelujah. God said, uh, hallelujah, I want you to launch out. Uh I want you to take this structure and I want you to launch out into systems and I want you to be relevant. I want you to be relevant governmentally. I want you to be relevant environmentally. Hallelujah, the first biosphere, hallelujah, was created by Noah. Hallelujah, he was the first one, hallelujah, to create a biosphere. He was the first one to understand that when God clears this area, I need to fertilize the area. You think he took all those animals just to hallelujah have a great big barbecue. Hallelujah while he was floating 40 days and 40 nights. Hallelujah the third compartment. Hallelujah was there to hold the composites so that when he got off the ark he could fertilize the land. Hallelujah and then he could create a new economic system. We got to think differently. We've got to build structures, um, hallelujah, that are relevant. Um, many of our structures are irrelevant uh, because culture changes every three to five years, but the church changes um, every 30 to 50 years. Um, hallelujah, it's time for us to shift. Um, hallelujah, not just, um, hallelujah, by the things that we say, um, but we got to change how we do what we do. Um, God wants to give you a new 
new strategy and he wants to give you a new technology. He said, when you launch out in the deep, I want you to use Nats plural. And then here comes Simon Peter. He said, look, I toiled all night. I've been involved with back-breaking activities. Hallelujah. He understood when he said, Master, I'm giving you the respect that you deserve. You're the great expert. You've got experience, but you don't know what you're talking about. I know these people. I know this city. I know this industry. He said, I've toiled all night. Hallelujah. I don't have anything to show for it, but at your word, don't get confused with what he is saying. He said, you're giving me a rhema word. You're giving me an understanding that it's time for me to shift. Ladies and gentlemen, we had the rhema word from Bishop that it's time for us to shift, but people still have the wrong context. It was Jesus that said in Luke 8, 18, hallelujah, take heed how you hear. For whosoever hath shall have even more. You got to understand that it's not just what you hear, but it's how you hear what you hear and how you respond to what you hear. Be careful that your context is right. That means when he answered Jesus, he said, at your rhema word, I will let down the net. I'm going to choose the technology because I know that after I have labored as hard as I've labored, nobody knows better than me how to plow. Hallelujah in this industry. In other words, what God showed me, Bishop, is that the church has become indifferent. I'm doing it because I got this word, but I'm disinterested and disconnected. We no longer trust God. We no longer put the energy and the faith. Hallelujah, where we need to put it. Now God gives us a word and we come to church so indifferent. We don't expect God to move like we did. We've got an indifferent church. We know it's indifferent because I watched when Bishop began to receive the offering and everyone was sitting up and they were disconnected and as soon as I saw it, God spoke to me and he said, break the spirit of indifference. I haven't come to judge you because I know what that feels like. A couple of months ago, I was so indifferent. I would listen to the word and it was like someone was pouring water on a doc's back. I didn't want to connect. I felt like this is a waste of my time and I was just going through the motion until the Holy Spirit said, Cindy, you need to watch out because you become over familiar with me. You think you know how I'm going to move. You don't know what I'm going to do in a service. You become indifferent. How many of you know what I'm talking about? You come to service, you listen to a sermon, and it's not hitting you like it used to hit you. It's an indifferent spirit, and you cannot cast out what you refuse to address. If you're mature enough, you are not going to wait until the preacher lays hands on you. You'll lay hands on yourself and you'll start talking to yourself. You got to get yourself together. We're almost like, hallelujah, Samson, shaking ourselves like we used to, but we don't have the power. I'm going to be honest with you. I'm going to call a spade a spade and I'm going to call the pink elephant in the room. There was a time when we were very anointed uh, and we can expect God to move uh, but now we become over familiar with the anointing uh, we are good at articulating a message uh, but the messages lack the luster it once had because we lacked the con that we lacked uh, the consecration that we used to have uh, we know what it takes uh, to move people emotionally uh, but we have lost what it takes uh, to move people 
people spiritually. If they don't write, don't work anymore. Give your neighbor a high five, boy, if you touch me. I'm going to punch you or I'm going to sue you for battery. You got to understand this. That it ain't about me moving you. Hallelujah. To say amen in the natural. But if the Holy Spirit can touch you without me touching you, then I need to sit down. You got to understand that what God is doing in this season, he's bringing the authenticity back and the integrity back. Hallelujah to the pew. I'm not standing here to try to hallelujah convince you that I can preach. I know I can preach. I'm not standing here trying to convince you that I can move through the serendipities of the English language with oratorical finesse. I'm not up here to impress you. I'm up here to activate you, to let you know that God is up to something great. But it's time for you to shift. How do I know it's time to shift? That what you are doing, you no longer need God. You no longer need to pray. You have lost the butterflies in your stomach. At your word, I'm going to do it. We're indifferent. We no longer take the whole word and do it. We take shortcuts. We know how to move people. We know how to tell the organist, hit the high C. Because even I know that high C turns the emotion on. We know how to do it, don't we? We know how to say it. We've examined it hard enough. But it doesn't matter. Because unless the pew is empowered, we are one generation away from being extinct. Our congregations are getting older and older. Where is the next generation of leaders tonight? It used to be the young people. Used to be in service and now we have to use all kinds of gimmicks just to have them to show up you got to understand that the next generation doesn't want gimmicks they want the supernatural they want the truth the whole truth and nothing but the truth they live in a world of deception and they see it all around them this is why occupy wall street is important for us to explore and examine because a group of people are now demanding integrity from leadership. They say we are not concerned about your faults but all we want to know is you got my best interest at heart. Peter was indifferent and God was getting ready to lead him into another realm, another realm of authority, another realm of power. It was an invitation. The Bible said that he was using an old technology and he was using it the way that he used to. And he said to himself, I know what's going to happen, so I'm not going to give it all. I'm not going to put all my passion in. The zeal of the Lord is missing in our church. We need the zeal back. We need the fire back. We need the right motive back. God is getting ready to bless the church. How do we know? We got five institutions that form the pillars of our society. Four of the pillars are broken. The church the educational system is broken. Government is broken. The uh, educational system is broken. Marriage is broken. The family is broken. The only institution that is not broken is the church. It's not broken because denomination never built it. It's not broken because a man had nothing to do with it. It was Jesus that said, upon this rock, I'm going to build my church at the gates of hell. 
shall not hallelujah prevail against it the church is not broken we've got broken people in the church I want to announce to you that your days of indifference is over you are belonging and you are part of something that doesn't have to do with man therefore you should not be looking at man you should be looking unto Jesus the author and finisher of your faith the Bible said he launched out but never changed his strategy he launched out and never addressed the technology and when he got out of them the Bible said he was enclosed with a multitude of fish ladies and gentlemen brothers and sisters the fish are coming whether you're ready for it or not but this is the last generation that's going to lose the fish because we lack the technological understanding of the dispensation and generation we are living in. The Bible said that the net broke, the structure couldn't sustain it, their strategy couldn't sustain it. God is about to take you from back breaking to net breaking. Are your nets ready? I know you've watched them. But are they strong enough to sustain the next influx of individuals looking for the truth? The Bible said that the ship began to sink and he beckoned his partners, those that he was connected with, his networks, his associates, his colleagues, those that were connected, but they did not have the capacity for the new. I want to ask you tonight, can the people sustain you when God does the new things? They know where you are now. They're good for you now. But can they take you to the next level? I decree and declare that you're examining your organizational structure. But not only your structure, you're examining your connections. There are people around you and they're good people but they only know you from yesterday and they can only work with you for today but can they help to take the ministry to where you need to be tomorrow have they changed your mindset do the same get the same do different get different the other ships came and they were still in the same organizational position they were in the season before they launched out brothers and sisters ladies and gentlemen there's a lot hanging on this hour we're getting ready to launch out in the deep do you have the capacity to take the organization to the next level who can you rely on Bishop can you rely on the people to sustain the growth that is coming can you rely on them spiritually? Can you rely on them financially? Do you still have to stand up and say brothers and sisters you know it takes a whole lot of money to put on a meeting like this. Can I get 10 of you to give a thousand dollars if you can't have to keep asking the congregation who's been around you for 10 and 15 years hallelujah to make up the budget they may be old able to hold your 10 foot ladder but they cannot hold your 20 foot ladder we got to press our ears to the mouth of God and many things you do today in order to prepare tomorrow is going to disappoint so many people I'm here to announce they'll be temporarily disappointed but permanently blessed those that carried you here might not be able to carry you there when a season change you should be changing your strategy and if you still have the same strategy 
And the say in a new season, you might as well perform a benediction because you're going to sink when you go to the next level. But I like Peter. Peter recognized that God, I missed it. He said, depart from me. I'm a sinful man. He used the word hamatalos. It's a Greek word derived from the Olympics and the sport of archery where the judge would raise his hand if they didn't hit bullseye. There's nothing religious about that word. He was simply saying, man, I missed it. If I only had the context for your concept, I wouldn't have missed it. I'm a sinful man. My strategies need to change. My associates need to change. My ship is sinking. And I've got to shift. I'm a sinful man. But Jesus said, don't worry about it. I'm going to teach you about the kingdom. And in the days to come, you're not going to miss it. I decree and declare that this is the last season. You're going to miss it. I decree and declare a new day is dawning. A new day is dawning for your ministry. You're not going to miss it anymore. A new day is dawning. A new day is dawning for your finances. You're not going to miss it anymore. I decree and declare prophetic bullseye. Everything you do is going to be bullseye. Rise, shine, for your light has come and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. The season has shifted. It's time for you to shift. It's time to change the strategy. Jacob was given a strategy. God will give you a new strategy for every season. Jacob was given a financial strategy. Joseph was given an economic strategy. Moses was given negotiation strategies. Deborah was given a military strategy. Solomon was given a business strategy. Cyrus was given a wealth building strategy. Mary Magdalene was given an underwriting strategy. Job had a comeback strategy. The three Hebrew boys had an educational strategy. Daniel had a political strategy. Joseph had a geopolitical strategy. Esther had a national strategy. Paul had a spiritual strategy. John the Revelator had an eschatological strategy. And Jesus had a kingdom strategy. You have been born for such a time as this. I come to announce that God has a strategy for you. He not only has a strategy, he has a grace. God has a space. God has a place. And God has a race for everything. Homelessness. 
darkness, the enemy of divorce, the enemy of perversion. God will give you the grace and the strategy for your ministry just to receive grace, to overcome rejection. Rejection is not a sign that something's wrong with you. Rejection is a sign that I know you missed it. I know you heard the word and you understood the concept, but your context was wrong and you missed it. But don't worry about it because from today on, what you're going to be connected with me and I'm going to make you a fisher of man Paul said I besought the Lord thrice that this thorn would be removed from me and Jesus said my grace is sufficient in your weakness my strength is made perfect you cannot be strengthened in a place of strength. You can only be strengthened in a place of weakness. And you can look at this structure. And from a panoramic perspective, you could see the weakness. It reminds me of the Titanic. They found out this boat was unsinkable. But while they were building, they were building other boats and other ships during that day. And what they needed was steel rivets. And one of the boat builders, they ran out of rivets. They ran out of steel rivets. One of the boat builders said, well, it's only a few. And nobody's going to see this anyway. where the boat hit, <clears throat> right where the rivets that they use, they compromise in areas that no one can see. And when they hit the iceberg, the ship sunk because it tore open like a zipper with the inferior rivets. 
And then it stopped with the specified rivets. There was that gaping hole and nowhere else that sunk the ship. It was Solomon <clears throat> that was wise. He said, you, you need wisdom. One of the writers said, it's the little foxes that spoil the vines, the little things. Your strategy has to sweat the detail. Your rivets. It's not what people see, it's the rivets that will sink the ship. It's interesting because <clears throat> Samson was going into a new season. The Bible said that he resisted the pressure to cave in. The pressure was so great <clears throat> that one night, exhausted, he lays on the lap of Delilah. And he wakes up the next morning with a bad haircut. His eyes are gouged out. The system will blind you. He was blinded. <clears throat> Secondly, the Bible said that he was bound. Then he had to grind. The system is all about blinding and binding and grinding. But when you make that lateral shift into the kingdom and we start building according to kingdom specificity, you begin to address who you are attached to and who you're connected with. That's a metaphor for every leader <clears throat> that in this season, alignment is everything. The head does not belong connected to the knee. Who are you connected with? Can they carry you to the next level? Scripture says, present your plans to the Lord. He'll establish your thoughts. The average leader is presenting their plans to their staff, and the staff are establishing their thoughts. This is not a democracy. Your elders don't get a chance to vote. The deacons don't get a chance to vote. If God gave this man of God a directive, it don't matter what you believe. We can't compromise the rivets. the ship will sink. It's not a democracy, but a theocracy. And so in this season, God is calling us to launch out in the deep. He's calling for new strategy. He's calling for us to look at structure, structure in your ministry. Can your structure carry you to the next level? And then if you're calling people, you can ask people for direction if they've never been where you're going. You, you've got to ask people that are on their way back, but not your traveling companions. If they're on the same road you're on, you don't have nothing to tell me. I heard from God, no, you didn't. You know, I can tell you don't have the fruit. You don't have the proof. If you know how to get there, you would have been there. If you know how to do this thing, you would be doing it. We cannot ask for direction from people who have never been where you're trying to go. Secondly, in this season, you've got to be careful who you're connected to. Samson lost his strength and his position in the kingdom. He was advancing because he was misaligned in his relationships. If you don't have people for the capacity to complement your weakness, who are your prophetic for? The paralytic had problems going through the door. Nobody would open the door for him. But his four friends carried him to the next round, took him to the roof. Not just a dimension. I'm impressed with your theology. But can you get me to the next 
realm. I don't want to go to the next dimension. I got that. Can you carry me to the next realm? Who amongst us can take this work to the next realm, the next realm? We're, we're pitching in the realm of billions where governments turn to us and ask us for advice. And we bring our Daniels out. We bring our Josephs out. We bring our Solomons out. We don't bring the talking deacons. But we bring our best and our brightest. And we say we have a strategy for the economic crisis. We have a strategy. I was in Princeton. They said, we are not inviting any more your preachers. And I said, why? They said, every time they come, they try to convert us. They said, we're convinced about your Jesus. We can tell by your work. We just want to know, does your Jesus have a strategy for our problem? Where are our strategies? We can strategize to keep us amongst people that think like us. But do we have the strategist to put us on a platform with people that don't think like us? Can we engage in a debate and bring the wisdom of God to bear on issues? When people say, I don't believe in the Bible, you telling them the Bible said, ain't gonna help. But when you could stand flat-footed and say, look, do you believe in quantum physics? And you explain God from quantum physics. Now you got my attention. You tell them, oh, I know how to fix Greenland and Iceland. And here's the system right here. There were 12 forms of capital. Number one, number two, number three. And you go down the list. And you say, if you do this, this will happen. We're those kinds of people in our church. And are we prepared to raise them? When the economists get saved, do we make them a deacon that counts money? And do we say, look, we're taking this to the next level. We want you to become an advisor to Bishop. There's a problem in Atlanta. There's a problem in Detroit. They want to turn the nation around. Can we come up with a strategy? Can we fix the Ebola? There's got to be someone in church. It was Elisha that goes into a city. There was a virus that hit the city and the waters were bad. And God gave him a strategy to give clean water. Where's the prophets that have technology as their portfolio? Where's the prophets that have economics as their portfolio? What about the social scientists? Where Esther was say, able to say, I'm more than just a pretty face. You have established a policy that I don't agree with. And God gave her a strategy. She threw a dinner and got to the decision maker and used a strategy to stop ethnic cleansing. I believe that's why we're here today, to do more than say you're a good preacher and you're anointed, to be able to say, let's look at the structure, let's look at our system, let's look at our strategy, and is it sufficient enough for where we're going? Not where we are, but where the world is going to be. It was my intention to give you the 40 shifts at a PowerPoint, and we're going to throw it up there. But I didn't have time. But if you invite me back, I throw the shifts up, and I will tell you the significance of each one of these, because these were the ones that a government would pay me a couple of million dollars, and I was going to give it to you for free. And it's against this backdrop that Bishop Moulton has brought us here to say we're shifting. We're building a structure. When you find out what they're going to be doing in 2014, 2015, I 
It took 10 years of research. When you find out what they're doing with technology, and what they're doing with food, and what they're doing with the human consciousness, you think iRobot is something? You think Avatar was entertainment? Right now, they are building and they're going to offer the world the first Avatar between 2015 and 2020. Are we ready for this? The food, the GMOs, is creating so many sickness. We're the healers in the church because the same people that are creating food are creating the pharmaceuticals. It's a money maker. So when the people come, they're gonna be sick. Who's anointed with the healing? Who, where are the healers? I'm not talking about the people that throw holy water from Israel made in China. I'm talking about an authentic anointing that lay hands and say, devil, I know you're there, come out. You got people that are sick in their mind. You don't know who's who in the church anymore. Where are the signs and wonders? Where people come in and they have the fear of the Lord. Nobody fears the Lord anymore. They want to sue you because you said, thus say God. We got to change the structure and the system to accommodate a people. Yet I'm born to tithe. And we're born in this generation for such time is this. We're not building sandcastles anymore. We're launching out into the deep because we must be about our Father's business. This is your time. This is our time. This is our season. This is the structure. And we're getting ready to launch out in the deep. Our Father and our God, I give you praise and honor and glory. I thank you for bringing us here for such a time as this, for giving us an understanding of where we are, for letting us know, oh God, that we do have a ship, we do have technologies, we do have strategies, but we get an opportunity to pull away from the masses to examine and explore. The United States is a great country and we voted President Barack Obama in because he promised change. But there was no model that he put on the table, so there's nothing for us to change into. So U.S. is still the same. But you have given this visionary a model. You have given him men and women that have the capacity. And I decree and declare an anointing that came upon Jabez that you were able to enlarge his territory, enlarge his capacity. I pray right now that your capacity is being enlarged. That God, even as he births you out, the discomfort and the pain, you will not rebuke it as if it's the devil. Ah, but you will understand that you're being birthed out into another realm of authority, another realm of power. You may miss it, but you've got Jesus Christ, the author and finisher, of your faith and he's able to do the exceeding abundantly above all you can ask or think don't hang on to the old that's where we wear but we're not trying to redo and uh, warm up something that is old we're here in this season to transition into the new all things are passed away all things become new I speak grace upon you I speak a freshness of the anointing I decree and declare that God is giving you the proper context for all of the concepts that will be shared with you during this week. I decree and declare fresh oil, that your times of frustration are over. I speak to the spirit of indifference. I understand it better than anybody else, but I decree and declare you will no longer be in neutral, that you would shift into gear that you would get your passion back, that you would get your audacity back, that you would say, if I die, I'm gonna die, but I'm not gonna die sitting here doing nothing. I decree that you would see yourself as the one that God has called to make a difference, not only in your family and ministry, but in this community and in this world. 
I decree and declare now that the place that you are standing is a place that will mark a transition. It's a place that you will never stand again. Your, 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 your past is past. And I decree and declare that the enemy you saw yesterday, you will not see that enemy tomorrow. I decree a revival. I speak that God is breathing on you right now. I decree and declare times of refreshing is coming to you that's coming from the presence of God. I breathe unto you the Holy Ghost. I say rise and shine. I decree and declare you're getting your energy back. You're getting your vim back. You're getting your vigor back. You're getting your excitement back. You're getting your joy back. You're getting your commitment back. You're getting it back. I decree that you will not withhold. I decree that you would see yourself as an underwriter. I decree and declare that you are giving more this year than you have ever given. I decree that you would no longer, hallelujah, sweat the small stuff. I decree that you would go to the bigger stuff. I decree and declare you would address what you need to address. You will say, I missed it, but I'm not going to miss it again. I decree that you're going to hear with a new ear. I decree that you would disconnect from the wrong relationship. I decree that you would make another commitment to this ministry, to this vision, to this man of God. I decree that you will understand we have gone too far. We have given too much to give up now. I decree the next generation is being worked out. I decree that fathers and mothers are being worked out. I decree and declare that this structure can sustain the growth. I decree the fish are coming. The fish are jumping, but the ship will not sink. I decree that God is reviving the leadership. I decree and declare a new alignment. Everything that is misaligned is being aligned. I decree and declare that God is anointing your head with fresh oil. I command the heavens to be open. I say lift up your head, O ye gates. Be ye lifted up, ye everlasting door, and the King of glory shall come in. I decree and declare that you are hidden in the secret place of the Most High God. You are abiding under the shadow of the Almighty. I decree and declare in the name of Jesus that it's your time, it's your season. I decree you are blessed that wherever your ministry is, wherever your business is. I decree and declare that it is the blessing of the Lord that makes you rich. It is daily loading you with benefits. I decree and declare the same God that caused Elijah's hallelujah acts to swim. The same God uh, that fed Elijah with ravens, uh, the same God uh, that turned, uh, hallelujah, the sundial back for Ahaz, uh, the same God uh, that ordered the sun to stand still, uh, the same God uh, that quenched the fiery furnace of the Hebrew boys, uh, the same God that's the same Daniel uh, in the lion's den. Uh, I decree that they, that is your God. He is the sovereign God. I decree and declare you are no longer leaning on the arm of flesh, but you are leaning on the arm of God. I decree and declare that you will hear with new ears, that you will not compromise the word, that you will fulfill the entire word. I decree and declare that in this season you will rely less on man and more on God. I decree and declare that you will understand that your times are in his hand. I decree that you would see yourself as a world-class moral ethical leader, that you would bear the light as an agent of change. I decree and declare that you are a difference maker. I decree that you are overcoming by the blood of the Lamb and the word of your testimony. I decree and declare that God will give you favor and he 
will be favored in every heart that thinks of you. In fact, let me digress. I speak to the mortgage. I decree and declare that your mortgage is met every month. I rebuke the spirit of lack. I speak wealth and riches in your house. I decree and declare job and better job for every member of your church. I decree an increase in time. I decree every single month there is going to be an increase. I decree and declare your people are giving more. I rebuke the spirit of fear. I rebuke the spirit of stinginess. I decree and declare your congregation is blessed. And as a result of being blessed, they are blessing you. I decree and declare that things are shifting in your house. I decree and declare that God is moving in your life. I decree and declare others believe in you. In fact, let me digress. I speak to your name. I decree and declare that any misunderstanding concerning you, I decree and declare that God is clearing up the misunderstanding. I decree and declare the healing of key relationship. I rebuke the spirit of confusion. I rebuke the spirit that caused the, 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 the rip in your relationship. I decree and declare a season where key relationships are being restored in the name of Jesus. In fact, I rebuke the liar. I rebuke everyone that betrayed you. I decree and declare that they will be proven a liar. I decree and declare that whoever is attempting to steal the sheep, I decree and declare they will be stuck in their way. I decree that the hemorrhaging is stopping. I decree increase. Increase financially. Increase spiritually. Increase numerically. I decree a stirring up of the wise heart. I decree Eliab and Bezalel are coming from the leadership. They will build according to the specification of the wind vision that God has given you. I decree and declare the anointing of a Levite is coming upon the leadership. I decree the joining. I decree and declare in the name of Jesus to every ministry. I speak into your financial coffers. I speak into your bank accounts. I speak into your savings account. I decree and declare you will not be bankrupt. Your bank account will never be cleaned out. Your business and ministry will never go belly up. It will never operate in the red. I call in wealth from the north, south, east, and west. I call in businessmen. I call in benefactors. In the name of Jesus, I speak strength into your spirit. I speak courage into your spirit. I speak wisdom into your spirit. I speak strategies into your spirit. I decree and declare you've got the anointing. You've got the grace to face your challenges. I decree you are overcoming by the blood of the Lamb and the word of your testimony. I decree you are no longer an underachiever. You are an overcomer. I decree you're coming out. You're coming out of your challenges. You're coming out of debt. Devil, you are lying. We're not going to throw in the towel. We're not going to give up. We are pressing ahead. We are pressing ahead with urgency, with integrity, with credibility. I decree that you're being burnt out. You're going to the next level. You're existing in new realms. New realms of power. New realms of authority. I decree the supernatural anointing of God for miracle signs and wonders. I give it to you tonight. I decree the releasing of new mantles. Devil, you're a liar. I decree a fresh anointing and decree fresh mantles and decree the mental of Elijah is coming upon you and decree you are a change agent and decree you are a difference maker and decree 
you are rising up that the anointing of wisdom and might and knowledge and reverential fear is coming upon you you are sharp in insight you are quick in discernment I decree that God is surrounding you with efficient staff members with experienced intelligent advisors in the name of Jesus everyone that shows up has the capacity for where you are going I decree and declare you are running a tight ship I decree and declare your rivets are steel and every rivet that has been ordered I decree no compromise I decree you're taking ministry to the next level a new level of excellence a new level of integrity I decree that you are upgrading technologically you are not afraid to be to the four corners of the earth I decree you may have 50 in your congregation but you're pastoring 5 million I decree you're preaching to the 5 million and not just to the 50s I decree upgrades in every area of your life spiritual upgrades economic upgrades technological upgrades I decree God is increasing your network so he's increasing your network I decree your hands are anointed I speak to the spirit of blindness you are seeing differently you're having an eye opening experience I command your eyes to be open I call you a visionary I call you a great leader from the front to the back I decree the anointing is lifting the burdens removing the I decree his yoke is easy and his burden is light. Now unto him who is able to do the exceeding abundantly as you launch out into the deep as you shift. It's according to the power that works. It works. It works. It works. It works. will do what we're doing. I want to do something. You know, I always wish I had more time. I wish I had the time to really teach you about the seed because it's, it's very powerful. It'll change your mind. Once you have a revelation or you're able to teach your people about the seed, it's on and popping. I wanted to go through the PowerPoint with the 40 shifts that affect ministries. It took me years to prepare it. 
And it's so interesting when you find out, you, you'll, you'll, you'll go like, okay, I understand what strategy, what the strategy looks like. We've lost our relevance. Like I said, culture changes every two to five years. Church changes every 20 to 50 years. As they lay in dollar for it. But we're gonna pay, play catch up. We're gonna be quantum leaped. Once we know our identity, who we are, we're gonna see some great things. But your seed is different from your offering. Your seed is placed in an economy and it has the assignment for giving you an ROI, return on investment. <clears throat> Nobody goes in business without understanding that we're living in a capitalist society. That means you have to have capital to give seed to the sower, to give capital to the sower. When you bring your money, it will stay money if you have no rev revelation of the seed time. It will just stay as currency. But the moment you have a revelation, that seed becomes your capital. <laughs> when you walk out of here, you don't look for money. You ask God for an idea. And he'll give it to you in seed form, but you have to cultivate that seed. One seed has the power to give you a lifetime of harvest. And the right seed planted at the right time breaks the wrong season, breaks the wrong cycle. Every woman knows that a cycle will continue on and on until her husband plants the right seed at the right time. And when she's pregnant, her cycle stops. The right seed given at the right time breaks the wrong cycle. Today, I'm going to receive a seed from you. It's a cycle breaking. I'm not the one that has a lot of gimmicks. I don't do gimmicks because I hate gimmicks. I sat where you sat. I sat with indifference because I didn't understand. Those of you that are in between blessings, I sat there too. I remember going to church with just a couple of pennies and they had $1,000 line, $500 line, $100 line. They prayed for everybody. But the ones of us that were poor, we didn't have any money. Nobody prayed for us. So I made up in my mind, I'll pray for everyone first and speak a blessing over their life. And then I'll give people opportunity once I teach them about the seed. I'll give them an opportunity to grow. Two points, God said to Isaac, I want you to take the seed, and I want you to go into an economy. It was the Egypt nation of Egypt and the nation of the Philistines. It was two nations that depended on this economy. And nothing that the government did, no plans, nothing that the businessman or the businesswoman did, no industry was healthy. Every industry had collapsed. And God said to Isaac, go into that economy. I want you to take a seed. I want you to plant that seed in the economy. And the scripture said, within that year, he gave him a hundredfold, the full yield of the seed. How could a person in a, an economy, in a nation who was bankrupt, how could they go into that economy where nobody was able to succeed? He goes into that economy as a foreigner and succeed. How could that be? He did it by revelation. As long as you have a revelation of a seed, you'll have an ROI. As long as you see seed like an offering, you'll be like I was, and I know how you feel. I gave $1,000 seed, I gave $10,000 seed, I gave $20,000 seed, and I never saw an ROI until God gave me the revelation, and it changed how I give. I don't wait for people to tell me what to give. I'm an underwriter. I underwrite budgets. I'm a kingdom underwriter. Romans 12 talks about the different kinds of anointings, an anointing to preach, 